I hope you've all had a good week. Our story this week is all about water, and certainly we've heard a lot about water this week, haven't we, with the storm. A lot of rain fell, and the waves in the ocean were just amazing. If you had a chance to see any of the pictures, it's quite amazing the power the, that the ocean has, isn't it? Some of those waves were enormous. I hope you didn't have to do too much cleaning up in your yard after the storm passed. Now, as I was looking at this week's story, I was reminded of a poem that I read back in school. It's called The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, and it's a very old poem written by a man named Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He published it back in 1798, and it tells the story of the ancient mariner. He was an old sailor. He's at a wedding, and he tells one of the wedding guests a story about one of his voyages. And he tells of a time when the ship he's on is stuck at the equator and the winds have died down and the ship can't move. And they are running out of drinking water. And they're on the ocean, surrounded by water. And the famous quote is, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Because of course, salt water is not safe to drink, right? It makes us very sick, but they're running out of fresh water. And they're getting very thirsty. All the sailors are very thirsty. And in our story this week, the Israelites in the desert are also getting very thirsty because, of course, there isn't a lot of water in the desert. And so they are wondering about how this is going to work. Now, remember that God so far has saved the Israelites from Pharaoh's army. And in last week's story, God made sure that the Israelites had enough food. Right? Remember, God provided quail for meat and manna for bread, and everyone had enough. Nobody could take too much, but nobody ran out. Everybody had just what they needed. Now, it's also very important to remember that at this point in time, the Israelites have spent a very long time in Egypt, and they don't know God anymore. And they are just starting to learn again that God loves them and that they can trust God to care for them. And so God has already protected them and provided them with food, but now they need water. And they wonder where God is. And they go to Moses and they start complaining and asking for Moses to give them water. And Moses goes to God and says, help, Lord, what am I going to do? And the Lord tells Moses, he says, take the elders of Israel with you and lead the people out to Mount Horeb. I will meet you there at the rock. Strike it with your rod and water will come pouring out. Enough for everyone. Now imagine what that would have been like. Imagine what it would be like to be in the desert. It's very hot, you're very thirsty, you don't know where there's any water. And you watch this man take his rod and strike a rock with it. Imagine what that would be like. And then imagine seeing that cold, clear water come gushing out. How good would that taste? Now, we are very blessed here where we live in Halifax that clean water is very easy for us to get. For most of us, we turn on a tap when we're thirsty and there's plenty of cold, fresh water for us to drink. However, too many people in the world do not have that. People in Canada, people in other countries. And we need to find a way to fix that. Remember that last week we talked about fairness and that a lot of people have too much. Most of us have far more than we need and too many people don't have enough. And the same applies to the water situation. We have plenty. Others don't have enough. So what we need to figure out is how we can help build God's kingdom here by making sure that everyone has what they need. And this week we need to think a little bit about water and how we do that. So what can we do? to help everyone have enough fresh, clean water. So let's give that some thought and we'll do a little research and we'll see what we can come up with. All right, have a good week, everyone. Take good care, wash your hands lots. God bless, bye guys. Hello, Bethany. Before I share with you today's scripture reading, I would like to extend a very big thank you to all of you on behalf of our local outreach committee for your continuous support and your donations uh, to our outreach ministry at Bethany. I want to in particular thank all of those folks who are uh, making casseroles for this week's supper at St. Andrew's uh, United Church. Uh, I had uh, 
put a call out to the congregation and of course as always uh, Bethany uh, supports those calls and many of you are making those casseroles and delivering them to St. Andrews and we greatly appreciate that and also to all of you who are uh, dropping off fruit donations uh, for St. Andrews as well. So we really appreciate your support, your continued support, and we thank you for your time and your dedication to our outreach ministry. And now today's reading is from Philippians verses one to five, chapter two. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good day. It's Kevin Little, uh, minister at Bethany United Church. Bet you didn't know that. Um, and I'm here to share with you um, a sermon about what Anne has just uh, read to you. And it's a, it's a story that is given to us about unity in the early church. Or you might say disunity. Because uh, in this lesson that we are given, we are told that Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing uh, to this church that he knows very well. And he knows that they have great affection for him and he for them. But he's heard that they have fallen into disunity. There is conflict in the church. Heaven forbid. Can you believe it? <laughs> so Paul is saying to them in this particular conflict, do not imagine that you are better than the others. Instead, treat others and their interests on the same level, at least, as your own. Do not count others as less than, but instead um, count them, if you will, as brothers and sisters. Achieve unity. Find a way so that the church can be together, unified. Now, when I say the word unity to you watching this broadcast, what do you imagine? What does the word unity mean to you? For a lot of people, it means everybody's on the same page. And there is a lot of imagery that goes with unity where people have this notion that we're all one big happy family. And sometimes what people think it means is that we all agree on everything. And my friends, the problem with the definition of unity as total agreement is that it doesn't take long for a church to fracture if that's the definition because you can never achieve unity as uniformity in any group of more than two or three. Because the larger the church is, the more people that are involved, and humans being all unique and different, means there's going to be disagreement. It just, it's just built into the fabric of community. Community will always have disagreement. And so, what does unity mean when you look at a group of people who have different points of view, have different gifts, and think differently. What does unity mean? Well, for Jesus and for the Apostle Paul, unity was not uniformity. In fact, 
Paul, in many of his letters, tells the people of the church, some of you are gifted as speakers, some of you are gifted as teachers, some of you are gifted as healers. You are all gifted by God in a different way. And yet, like a human body, you are called to be unified. That is to say, you are to use all of your different gifts in different ways so that, like a human body, you can all be unified with one purpose. But likewise, even with opinions, you can be together. So, Paul sometimes writes and says, you disagree on issues of what is the most important day of the week. You disagree on circumcision. You disagree on following the law in a particular way. That's okay. What we need to be unified on, says Paul, is that Jesus, for us, is Lord. And that we believe that we are called, all of us together, to love one another. And we are brothers and sisters. I don't think you can separate Jesus calling his disciples, his followers, the calling from unity. In other words, what I want to say to you today, if there's anything that you take away from this sermon, it's that unity is not so much uniformity. It's not so much that we all agree or that we're all the same. It's the opposite. We're all different. We disagree. But we are called somehow, some way, to work together for common goals. Now let me be clear. If the church doesn't have some common goals, it isn't going to work. You can't be unified without having a common mission to love one another, to, be, to care for one another. The church cannot exist unified without mission. However, and this is the good news, you can have a common mission and disagree on everything. <laughs> well, not everything. You can disagree on music. You can disagree on liturgy. You can disagree on how to interpret the Bible. You can disagree on all kinds of things if you have a common mission. Jesus called together Jews and Gentiles and Samaritans. Jesus called together rich and poor. Jesus called together people who were uh, establishment, who were, who, who were doing very well in society, and people who were not doing well. He called together women. He called together tax collectors. Jesus, and his symbol for that was the meal, the table, where everyone would be at the table eating together. That was Jesus' vision. Everyone would be together. But there would be a common mission. And the mission was that they around the table would care for each other. And, this is important, if there was a place at the table that was empty, we would go out into the street and we would bring people in so they too could have room at our table. In other words, what unity is, is not uniformity. Unity is gathering. Unity is bringing disparate and different people with different points of view from different backgrounds together to be a family, to be um, a movement. In the early church, they were called people of the way. And some of the early church historians or people of the Roman times who used to write about the early church used to say things like, see how they love one another. So my friends, here's the thing. In these little early churches, in these houses, people strongly disagreed on all kinds of issues. They didn't always agree on how to worship or how to elect leaders or what day of the week to, to, to worship. They would disagree on all kinds of things. But they ate together. And when they were dying, they took care of each other. And when they were poor, they gave money and help to each other. 
And when they were sick, they healed each other. They didn't all agree. They weren't all alike. They had very different gifts. They were all unique and separate that way. But they were unified like a human body by a purpose. They were all different, but they were unified because Jesus had said, go out and gather. Bring people into, into this space. And you'll remember one of the most famous passages you'll ever hear is John 14. In my father's house, there are many rooms. You heard that one before? And what does that mean? Is it all a celestial thing about in heaven there's a separate little room for me, a gold-plated room, you know, where, I, where I'm, you know, being rewarded like Freedom 55 for all the things I did? No. In God's space, whatever that looks like, I don't know what that looks like. In the space, in that space, there's a space for you, and there's a space for me, and there's a space for all of us. And what Jesus came to teach us is that there's a space for everyone because we're all different and together we are the church. Thanks be to God. Amen. some of the emails I send out every day that we've been praying in particular for some of the folk that we know and love in our community, um, Bud McDonald and Elroy McKillop. We keep them in our prayers uh, and they've given permission for me to share that. We also keep any number of people who I have been um, talking to who are going through some very, very challenging times around their health um, and those our persons have not publicly disclosed, but I know who they are, and I'd ask you to keep um, people in our church in your prayers. We also keep in our prayers people from not necessarily our family, but who, who we know uh, by seeing them around our good city of Halifax. And so today is our day to feed uh, 250 people at, at St. Andrew's Sunday suppers. So if you're watching this uh, before uh, supper time on Sunday, uh, you'll know that uh, on this very night, uh, the, the 250 people gathered at St. Andrew's Church, uh, one of whom, by the way, Sean Wynott will be there serving, um, will be uh, serving casseroles made by you, Bethany United Church. So we pray for those uh, good people who will be there to feast on the food that we will be sharing. So let us pray. So God, we give thanks for the gift 
of unity for all of those unique gifts that you have given to us. Some of us have been given the gift of healing, of teaching, of care. Some have been given the gift of being able to, to create with our hands things like that people can eat or build. But all of us contribute in some fashion to the building up of community and people. For in the midst of our differences and our diversity and our disagreements, there is a unity in love. There is a unity when people who are very different somehow come together. And in a critical moment, someone who is a prayerful person feeds someone who does not pray, but suddenly needs it. Or someone who is very social and has never been alone, has a conversation with someone who is very comfortable with silence and aloneness, and they are given a gift. In our differences, we can teach each other. We can share with each other. God, we are so grateful for the unity of, 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 of purpose that you give to all of our differences. And on this day, we hold up the prayer that brings us together, that takes all of our differences and somehow fashions in them words of purpose. As we say the words that Jesus gave us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory and forever and ever. Amen.
images that Barry has shared with us and the beautiful singing that Anne has shared with us and all the beautiful music that Sean has played with us um, and you've tolerated my scruffiness um, and, and the sermon, um, whatever that does for you, I hope it does something. But now the more formal aspect of this gathering has come to an end. Wherever you are, whether you're in your pajamas or your, in your sweatpants or your clothes or you're wearing a tie, whatever, a dress, whatever it is, however you are, God love you for being with us. We really appreciate you connecting with us. And now that our time of worship is over, our service really begins. Thank you.